good morning. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I am uh, pleased to welcome you uh, here this morning to our forum on distance learning. And we are webcasting this event live, so we also would like to welcome our viewers from around the country uh, as well as around the uh, globe. And we have set up a Twitter uh, feed at hashtag TechCTI. That's hashtag TechCTI. Uh, so if you'd like to post comments or ask questions uh, during the forum, you're welcome to avail yourselves of that. And when we get to the Q&A, we'll actually take questions both from the Twitter audience and the webcast audience as well as those of you who are here uh, with us uh, today. Educators around the world are experimenting with distance learning as a way to improve access to digital materials. Distance learning connects geographically remote students with instructors and fellow uh, classmates and allows for collaboration and shared learning experiences. The question is what students, teachers, and administrators can do to harness the power of social networking to improve educational outcomes. Uh, Brookings just published a book of mine a couple weeks ago entitled Digital Schools, in which I look at uh, many of the new educational technology innovations that are taking place around the United States as well as uh, outside of the United States. There are really fascinating innovations taking place in distance learning, in social collaboration, uh, in the use of mobile uh, technology and uh, video games. There are new assessment tools that are coming online. One of the things I like about technology is it allows for real-time data analytics so we can actually look at what students are learning in a much more uh, nuanced uh, manner uh, than uh, we've ever uh, uh, made possible uh, before. So we have copies of the book uh, outside if uh, you are interested in that. To help us understand uh, these uh, new tools, uh, we are pleased to welcome uh, Senator Mark uh, Begut. Uh, the senator was elected to the Senate uh, from Alaska in 2008 after serving as mayor of Anchorage for nearly uh, six years. He has spoken out on education issues and the importance of innovation in the classroom. He also chairs the Commerce Committee's Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and the Coast Guard, as well as the Democratic Steering and Outreach uh, Committee. So today he will uh, discuss some of his thoughts uh, on uh, education and education technology and answer a few questions. So please join me in welcoming the Senator to the Brookings Institution. Thank you all very much. Thank you for the opportunity. First, uh, to the Brookings and Patel, thank you very much for sponsoring this. I, I, let me give you um, a little uh, sense of where I come from. I come from a family of educators, my mother, my father, my sisters, my sister-in-law, my brothers have worked in education. So education is part of who we are in our family, and it's, it's obviously something uh, that I think is pretty important. And then you come from a state uh, that is pretty diverse in the sense of its distance and, and how to deliver education. And if you have 80% of your communities uh, not connected by the road network, that the only way to get to them is you fly to them, you boat to them, or in the winter you might snow machine to them. Uh, pretty uh, difficult area uh, to get folks um, to get all the education as well as just basic supplies to survive. So thank you very much. And uh, even though I don't sit on the help committee, the education committee for the Senate, I'm fairly active in this arena. I've learned one thing in the Senate, it really doesn't matter, uh, well it does matter what committees you're on, I shouldn't say that, but, uh, but because you're one person in the Senate, you can make inroads in a variety of areas. If you care enough about it and you want to talk about it in rural education, it's one of those that we are pretty aggressive about. Uh, we have great challenges. Half our Alaska Native population, uh, which is about 17% of our state, is under the age of 18. And so it's a pretty significant, and predominantly live in rural communities all across the state, in small villages that in some cases may not even have running water. So education for us, and what I think in how to deliver it is fairly important. Um, and I know you, you, you talked about, I should also tell you, uh, technology, um, I tell people all the time, I don't know all the depths of how it all works, but I know what I want. And, uh, and I'll give you an example. I remember when I was on the local city council in 1988, 89, 90, right in that range. I was on there for 10 years, but in that first three years, uh, I was 26 when I got elected. And back then they had a mechanism which was called a pager. 
Now, maybe you not, some of you might not even know what that is. Uh, and they had a portable computer called the K-Pro, <laughs> which was like a suitcase. There, someone knows what that is. <laughs> it's in the museum down the street, but it's like a suitcase. But uh, I remember I was, I, I'd been in the real estate business, and uh, you know we'd have these Tuesday night meetings. Have you ever been subjected to a city council meeting? I apologize for that. Uh, but you know, you'd go there, to testify on your issue, and you're there till midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And uh, you know, so I have apartments, and I was always concerned that if I'm there and I, something emergency happens, I need to be available. So we had, the, I had this little pager, and it made no music. It made All it did was beep, three beeps, beep, beep, beep. Nothing, that's it, nothing more than that. Um, so, you know, once in a while in those three, those first early three years, it went off a couple times, nothing major. But the other members got so frustrated, uh, they put together a, a resolution to ban uh, this technology from the assembly room. Uh, I, I, you know, I remember we owned the phone company, one of the largest phone companies in the country because no one would provide phone service to Anchorage, so we had to create our own company many, many years prior, and we were getting ready to market it, sell it. Um, and Cities got a free, uh, from the government, a license for mobile phone service. Now, you got to put yourself back there. I, I remember sitting in a meeting, which is now public, it was an executive meeting, but it was a private meeting with the assembly members, and we were looking at our phone company, and you know, the hard line and yellow pages were doing great, a lot of cash flow. But this thing called mobile phone was losing money hands over fist. And people, oh, we gotta get rid of this thing. It's a money loser. No one wants to, who, who's gonna carry around a phone, right? I'm, this is serious discussion, I'm, I'm like, so I was 27 at that point, it's a year, 27, 28, a couple years after I was on there, and I said, uh, any of you watch Star Trek? And I said, you know, that's going to happen. And they looked at me like I was a nutball. And uh, several years later, we got ready to sell the phone company. And the reason we got the money we got for the phone company was one piece of the equipment in there, our license to deliver phone service through mobile devices. That was the cash cow. That was the cash flow of the future, not Yellow Pages, which, I mean, you know, now we get them at the door once in a while. I'm like, what are they doing with this? It's like a doorstop. You know, it's, it's the most amazing transformation in a very, very short time. But delivering education through this is a challenge and also very different for some people. My generation understood it to a certain extent. My son's generation, who's 10 now, it will be a no-brainer for them. They will wonder why we're not delivering education through the new means of technology. You know, we talk about uh, how we're gonna develop our education system. I know delivery is one piece, STEM legislation is another piece, which we like to call in our office STEAM, uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And I'll give you an example. With my young son who, you know, we want, you know, you always want your kids to play some music. I mean, I, I did. I, don't do it now, but I did then. Uh, I didn't want to, uh, but he loves numbers. So, you know, he, we're trying to get him interest in the piano, has no interest, until we move the keys into numbers rather than letters. Then he thought it was kind of like a mathematical problem. Thought it was very interesting. Now he plays, he can pick music and pretty much within a very short time, learn it and memorize it. I remember his first um, recital concert at the school. This was a year ago. And he wanted to do his own piece, and the teacher was like, you know, oh, God, what does this mean? Uh, so he did the classical piece as required, and then he melded it in the latter half of it with a Lady Gaga song uh, on piano, all by memory, because the mathematical elements of music. So for me, it's not just science and technology and engineering and math, which we're way behind, way behind. I was just doing a speech last night on the floor, and uh, it was about all this election money and all this, and I was talking about when the last time we had major reforms to our election policy, and it was 1972 and Watergate and all this occurred, but then I was looking at what happened in 1972, and by a fluke I looked, fiber optics were invented in 1972 which now we just kind of take for granted how important it is. So, but it was, but what was interesting, the two major inventions in those days, it said USA, USA. I remember as a kid going to the Almanac and looking at the invention section. I always thought it was pretty interesting. USA, USA, USA. Today, 
That's not the case. We're so far behind in these areas, it's unbelievable. It's appalling, actually. And so from my perspective, in order for the next generation to be successful, for this country to be successful in this new global economy we live in, uh, the issues of STEM and reaching to the far ends of this country is going to be critical. More people are living in rural America, especially uh, now than ever before. People are moving to rural America, and we have to make sure there's connectivity to it. It's the hardest access, but the most important, in my view. You know, we have uh, a couple of policies, and, and uh, my view is, you know, we, as I just said, we have to think about this new world, how we compete in this global economy, but also how we integrate innovation. Uh, if we don't do that in the sense of allowing may they be these young kids or teachers to express the new opportunities that are available to them or what they're thinking of the possibilities are, we're never going to advance this economy at the level we need to. Uh, I've introduced uh, three bills in, in my time here, my short time here already on quality, uh, on focusing on quality teachers and expanding some of the programs we already have that are working very well. For example, in the University of Alaska, we have a program uh, which is Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program. This is uh, the cool, I, I, you know, I, I walked into this program when I was mayor. I was mayor of Anchorage for five and a half years before I came here. And uh, there was like seventh graders here building computers from scratch. I mean, in seventh grade, I, I was banging boards together, you know. Uh, they were building computers. And this partnership that we had and have today is with the university, the private sector, and our education, K through 12, and they were doing the summertime. Now, in Alaska, you have to put this all in perspective. When you get the summer, you really want to be out in the summer, and to be in school is not something a kid looks forward to, but these kids were enthusiastic. They were excited about it because they were taking a knowledge and transforming it into something they can feel and touch, and at the end of the day, they got to keep that computer. It was an amazing watching these young people, these seventh and eighth graders. The same program also has another pro program called Tablet Tutoring Program, where rural students uh, out in rural communities with college team up with college tutors and use the tablets as whiteboards out in rural Alaska, taking that technology right in their hands. We were talking in the car here. I said, we have no idea today where we're going to be five years from now, ten years from now. The ability, we do a lot of video conferencing to folks all around the state and Skyping and so forth. When the technology advances, and it will, and what we'll see in the future, it will be like I am sitting right here, but it will be video. It will be different than we can imagine today. Now, a lot of us will be like some of those assembly members I sat around with 20 plus years ago that said, mobile what? But it will change because of technology, but we can't do it unless we have young people who are understanding the value of STEM education and understand how to utilize that in the best way. So from our end, we also have, with those tablets and that college connection, we have oil and gas companies working with them. Why? Because they see this as a huge piece of their job opportunities in the future. So it's public, both in higher education and K through 12, and private sector combining their efforts and working with seventh and eighth graders. And, and I will tell you, I did a lot of work on juvenile justice systems. Six, seven, eight, highest risk kids in any school, any city, any community, at risk of getting in trouble. Why? Because they're changing. Their bodies are changing, their minds, and how they're interacting with people. So if you can give them something constructive, you can take that energy and shift it. They're the highest risk kids. Why not give them something that they can do, do something positive about? Uh, from my end, also, we have uh, introduced a program called Effective STEM Teaching and Learning Act, which provides grants to states to develop comprehensive STEM strategies, but also another piece of this, and this, as I mentioned in my opening, uh, you know, I'm surrounded by educators in my household, and I actually chaired uh, the secondary, post-secondary education commission for the state of Alaska for seven years and the Student Loan Corporation for seven years. And the important part of as you develop these STEM strategies and providing grants to schools and so forth, you need to also provide capacity for the educators to get the professional training. Because here's what we like to do. And I've learned this, again, in less than four years here. Uh, we love to pass laws here that sound good. And then we tell teachers, good luck. We want, we want you to succeed. And when they don't, then we find them 
<laughs> we penalize them like Ch No Child Left Behind, which just so you know, I hate that bill. Um, I actually ran a whole campaign on that when I ran for Senate, um, another issue. But um, this is the way it works. They pass, sounds good, and then we give no professional development support. We expect the teachers to know how to teach this new concept or new subject matter in very short order, usually by the next school year, and go, go get busy. Teach it. You must know it because we passed the law, so you must know it. Well, our bills always focus, everything we do is not only about, like in this case, grants to communities for STEM education, we also then make sure there's professional development because the combination of the two will make those schools more successful no matter where they are. We also introduced, uh, for rural communities, housing is a big issue. Now, people say, well, what do you mean? Well, you know, when, if you don't have a teacher or a young person who becomes a teacher from that same community, teaching that community, you're importing someone. And housing is a big piece of the equation. Can they find quality, affordable housing to live in the rural community they're about to go? And in Alaska, I guarantee you housing is important. And so we have to ensure that there's adequate housing uh, to and allow for teachers to have the capacity uh, to be able to not worry about that but focus on their kids. So we've introduced a bill that focuses on making sure there's some resources. The third bill I introduced is Investing in Innovation Act, I-3. Um, you know, when I first got here, everyone in D.C. does these cookie-cutter deals. They say, you know, if we do this program, it's going to work everywhere. Well, not for rural America, not for rural Alaska. You have to keep in perspective that there's different circumstances. And innovation, uh, we want, we know innovation on the ground floor is happening in the classroom, in the community uh, schools, or wherever they might be. And instead of trying to say, well, that is great in Alaska, so we're going to replicate it everywhere, let's figure out how to take what they're doing and expand it in their community if they want to. So these innovation grants are focused on what works on the ground floor, not to bring it from here down, but let it bubble from the bottom up. And the same thing, again, allowing uh, efforts to ensure that there's rural component. In the I-3 contains a 25% set aside for rural communities. Because again, rural communities get left out. Every bill I see now, I don't care if it's FAA, defense, transportation, education, we look at the rural component. And it's always amazing to me, you hear this, well, it's gonna work, if it works in New York, it will work everywhere. If it works in Seattle, it's gonna work everywhere. They have no clue when you go to a rural community where the school might be 10 people. You know, my school, graduation class, high school, was 30 people. That's it. School of 225. That's it. You know, it's not that, you know, we think there's rural is better or urban is better, but you got to make sure the resources are allocated properly so rural America is not left behind. And it's important that we, as we grow cities, we ensure that rural America is complemented. The other essential piece overlaying all this in rural America is access to broadband, access to communications. Where we are today, 3G, 4G, you know, all these different levels of speed, where we will be in 10, 15 years from now, we can't even fathom. I don't care if there was a conference on the future. We, we have no concept of what it's going to be. If I took you back, like I said, to the days of the late 80s, early 90s, real early, like 90, 91, and I pulled up out on the website and said, let's find a conference that occurred there on communications of the future, you'd rarely see what we're seeing today. An iPad, you know, where you can communicate, as I just described to you, as a whiteboard to rural communities. People will, you know, there'd be some guy in those conferences in the back corner that would be having all those great ideas, and people would say, you know, he's kind of different. You know, he's, you know, I don't know what he's talking about, but I got a fax machine, you know. I don't know what he's talking about, you know. What do you mean in the air, you know? You got to hook it up, you know. So, I mean... And it's hard to believe that, but if you went back and looked at news articles and see where we were and what people were talking about, or even publications that people were doing for the conferences all the teachers were going to or educators, you'd be amazed what they talked about then and what we're talking about now. And 20 years from now, we'll look back and say, that's what we were talking about? We're so far ahead of that. 
It's unbelievable. So the, the opportunity of distance learning, access, is going to be a big piece of this. Because if you can't deliver it, uh, you'll be, in no way can we improve the capacity of our young people in these rural communities. And the distance learning for Alaska, and I, I was in Kodiak, Alaska, an island, largest Coast Guard base in the country, a fishing community, pretty significant. And I loved it. There was this teacher who, on the screen, he had three classes going throughout the Kodiak region from different grade levels, and he could carry on a conversation with each one without each one engaging with the other. In other words, if he's teaching fifth grade, that person saw that. But he saw it all. This teacher, I think he came from Nebraska. I can't remember where he came from, but it was the Midwest. He, I thought he was going to jump through the screen because he was so excited. We had to actually stop him because of his presentation. He said, okay, I got it. But what was amazing is that teacher, and he said, this was the most exciting education opportunity he ever had. And he'd been teaching for many years. But he said he was able to do something he's never done before, connecting with people from different levels and engaging them when he, you know, for example, he engaged them at certain levels, all three of the students. Sometimes he separated them out. And the kids, of course, were, you know, it was no big deal. Bam, 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 bam. They're working off of this. Not new to them. But for him, it was new, exciting, innovative. When we move up the speeds of delivery, it'll be like he was sitting in each one of their rooms. And when that happens, we will explode in the education capacity. You know, today, when you talk to business leaders, I can tell you in the defense industry, uh, you know, it's interesting where we're at right now. We, we bought in the last three years, when you talk about science and technology, more unmanned aircraft than manned aircraft. So what do you think that means? They're now trying to figure out these guys that operate these that aren't on the front lines. They figured out that, you know, because they're not on the front lines, but they kind of are on the front lines. How do we award them for their service because they're at a computer, at a joystick in California, running these things in Afghanistan. The technology is exploding, and what it means in the future is still undetermined, except I do believe every step we've moved with technology, delivering education through this means, we've advanced. But we have a lot of work to do to get our young people in our education system to recognize the capital investment it takes, the human capital investment it takes, and ensuring that these young people have uh, the educators to move them to the next arena. Let me just end there and just say thank you very much. I get you get a sense here. I get pretty uh, excited about this because you know I, I work in an environment where uh, it's technology. They're challenged a little bit around technology. Um, let me just say that. Um, uh, and so when I think about the future, where we're going to be, I just know where we've been. And I've had these discussions with folks that are, when I came in at 26 in the assembly, I was the youngest one ever elected. And so when I was talking about pagers, they looked at me like I was a nutball. Well, you know what the end of that story is? You go into that assembly chamber today, everyone's on computer, all of it's virtual. Uh, people who call in, you can now vote via um, the, the, the communication network there, the assembly members can. Uh, the testimony that we get, we have a high... Uh, this unbelievable technology in the assembly room to bring people from all over the world to testify. People have their cell phones. They're connected. That's allowed now because they recognize the value of this tool to inform the public but educate themselves on what they need to do. So from a day they outlawed it 20 years ago to today, where we'll be 20 years from now is unknown. But I can tell you the kids of today... Uh, when, we're, when I'm sitting around, hopefully retired in some form, they'll be talking a language I'll have no clue what they'll be talking about. And I'll be excited about it because it will mean that we've advanced beyond where we even thought we could be. So again, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take a couple questions if that's okay. I don't know what the time is, but thank you all very much.
technology. <laughs> okay, uh, the center has time uh, just f uh, for a couple questions. So if you can uh, raise your hand, uh, if you can give us your uh, name and organization, and we would ask you to keep your questions uh, brief so we can uh, get to uh, more people. Uh, we have a question here up front. So there's a microphone coming over to you. Thank you. Uh, Peggy Orchowski, I'm the congressional correspondent with the Hispanic Outlook on Higher Education. And of course, there's a lot of interest in this. But um, of course, there's some dark sides that are going to have to be worked out. I think a lot of teachers are really afraid of being replaced. Um, there's an article today in the Washington Post about giving grants in Virginia for teachers to uh, show how they can be replaced by, uh, by the computers, you know, the internet. And, and there's nothing that can really replace a good teacher. A lot of teachers find they're just pushing buttons. So what do you, are you finding? I mean, you have a multitask teacher who loved sure. it, but I think a lot of teachers are really, really going to push back. Yeah, I, I think you'll, you'll find that it doesn't matter what industry. When there's technology advancement, people get nervous. Your, the assumption is we have enough teachers today. That's not a good assumption. When one of the biggest issues we debate is teacher-pupil ratios. Right? It's the biggest issue we debate. So how do you enhance that? My sister, who started in education, uh, teaching a program, keeping young people, young women, in school who became pregnant. That was her program. Today, she now runs the programs on how to access teachers to higher educate or to uh, touch their kids through distance learning. So there are new advancements. The reality is you're going to have, in any organization, doesn't matter if it's teachers or whatever, you're going to have when you move technology up, you'll have some who say, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to do that. Well, okay. They're probably not going to be, honestly, the best teachers with this new world we're about to get to. It's not a question of if it's happening. You know, w will it happen? It's happening. So we have to adapt. Second is you'll have younger teachers who have come up through the system and says, of course, this is what we do. This is what we use. This is, you know, to imagine when I went to high school, we could barely be allowed to have a calculator in the classroom. A handheld calculator, you know. IBM Selectric Typewriter too. The big deal on that one was correctable tape that went backwards. <laughs> Whoa, that was like an advancement beyond belief. So, but we advance. And I think teachers, it will open up new doors. For one, instead of teachers constantly spending so much time just trying to manage their classes and move from point to point. I believe if we do this right, we will give more capacity for teachers to expand and be innovative in more education arenas. I really believe it because what happens, imagine, I mean, you all know a teacher, and or you're a teacher. You're under great stress every day. You're trying to just get, you know, you're getting your class prep done, you're, you're going, and it's tough. And at the end of the day, you don't even have time to think about what you want to do to really get creative with your students, to bring them beyond where they are today. And that's a struggle. But I think you're going to have this. It's going to be a friction. But I do believe those smart school districts that figure out how to mix and meld it are going to be able to utilize their teachers and maximize the teachers. Because the assumption right now is we don't have enough teachers in the school system. Anyone who thinks there's more teachers than we need, let me know. I miss that train. I mean, and we have a great education system in Anchorage, Alaska, where I was mayor. But I'm going to tell you, if we could hire another 50 teachers, we'd do it. But if we can augment it and meld this new technology with kids who want to learn it, then I think we, we're going to get the best of both worlds. Well, you will have people. Okay, uh, I think we have time just for one more question. Uh, right on the aisle uh, is a question, and then the center has to get back to Capitol Hill. Hello, uh, my Because we think we'll vote because we have to go there and say yay and nay. We use no technology <laughs> in the Senate chambers. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Levy. I'm one of the technology program officers at IES, Institute of Education Sciences, which is part of the U.S. Department of Education. So I'm particularly interested in the couple programs you mentioned for the middle school students, the sixth to eighth graders, yeah. the build your own computer yes. over the summer and the tablet. Uh, have there been any longitudinal studies to see yeah, whether have. those programs had any uh, impact on the students, yes. say, improved learning outcomes or increased choice in a STEM education? Yeah, there have been, and actually we had them here, I'm looking at Prue here, works for me. We had this group here about a month, two months ago maybe, two, three months ago. We had them actually do a presentation here, uh, and they were at the museum, and we had the students here building these computers, and there is uh, some great stories, we'll be happy to share them to you, but there's no question the impact it's having. And there's a piece that it's hard to measure, um, and that is 
you know, because they don't necessarily do this, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, again, high risk students for making bad choices at times and the outcome of that. It's hard to determine that until you go down a lot further, but there clearly is some clear evidence that they're engaged and they're changing into a positive environment. We have huge uh, data on what our Alaska Native young people and their uh, uh, bad behavior, keep it simple here, uh, has been and what programs like this do to move them to the other side. So we'll be happy to share that with you. But, it, but it's, you know, it, it is like taking shop and putting it on steroids, okay? Which I also think we should keep shop in the classroom, but that's another story for another day. Because people need to work with their hands. You know, they have to understand that, because that creates another kind of learning. Uh, if it's just book and computer, that's one piece. But you have to have this other piece, this physical uh, activity. And I think in the case of the computer construction, that they're actually building these things is an amazing outcome. So absolutely, we'll share it with you. I'll take one more quick one. That will make Prue, she's nervous, but that's okay. I'll take one more. You, <laughs> okay. know, you have to always keep your staff on edge. <laughs> Otherwise, there's one back there I saw his hand up. So. Okay, yes. Uh, somebody he knows who he is. There he is. Yeah, right there. Thank you. I had a hand up. Thank you, Senator. Um, Fred Winter, also from the U.S. Department of Education, but from the Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Ed, which, like fiber optics, is celebrating its 40th anniversary this year. There we go. Um, question for you. In light of the federal budget constraints and potential cuts, sequestration, other issues, um, what do you see as specific possibilities in the federal role in contributing to the technological progress you see over the next few decades? Well, the stimulus bill, as you know, put a lot of money into broadband, uh, high-speed broadband around the country. We, we've benefited. Uh, 100 and some villages now will have access to high-speed broadband they didn't have four years ago, as an example. That's a huge investment. Uh, but on a broader sense, you know, when we get to this collision course in November and December on the federal budget and all this, my, my argument has been very simple. There's three things. I don't care if you're a senator that's so conservative or a senator that's so liberal, we have three things we have to do to solve this budget problem, which will then go to your question in a little more broader, and that is we're gonna have to deal with budget cuts, revenue, investment. Investment in education, energy, and infrastructure. If we don't do this piece, I guarantee you 10 years from now we'll have this discussion wonder why we're now number 50 in the world on these areas. Not 23, 24, 25, but 50. And so the challenge is getting people to understand that. Our former governor, when I had a debate on the stimulus bill with her, we talked about uh, broadband. And she considered that a social program, social service program. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, broadband is the highway of this century. You know, building the interstate system was not a social program. It was an economic opportunity in connecting people. Well, this is the new connection. And so we have to Make sure people understand that who are in the political arena. And I think there's been some great efforts. The stimulus bill pumps some good money into this, but not enough. This is a uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of invest, billions of dollars of investment that have to be done. And it's just like when we laid the roads down in this country. This broadband is the next piece of this equation in a way that doesn't matter where you live, that you can access high-speed broadband and be able to touch the world from wherever you are. That is critical for us. Okay, thank, thank you, you all very, very much. much. Uh, please join me in thanking the uh, senator. Good morning. I'm looking forward to continuing the discussion that the senator started uh, earlier today. And I want to start by describing just a little bit about the current landscape of online learning. Um, distance learning with technology can mean many things today. According to INACL, the International Association for K-12 Online Learning, there were an estimated 1. million enrollments in distance education courses uh, in K-12 schools during the 2009-2010 school year, which is up from about 50,000 uh, a decade ago. Um, but higher education, of course, has been out front in tapping online education. Uh, more than 6.1 million college students took an online course during the fall of 2010, according to a report from the Sloan Consortium. Um, distance education can come in many forms. Students can now opt for full-time online education. They can take advantage of hybrid courses. They can access online material while they have a face-to-face -face instructor. Um, they can use social networking, video gaming. 
Um, and technology is also bringing science experts, advanced classes, and language lessons to students who otherwise would not have access to them. And in a lot of uh, environments, particularly urban environments, um, schools are using online credit recovery to help students focus on concepts they need to relearn instead of having them sit through lessons uh, on uh, things that they've already mastered, on topics they've already mastered. And they're using uh, mobile phones, they're using iPads, desktop computers and laptops, all kinds of technology to do all of this. Um, and the way the courses are delivered, uh, sort of the, the structures are also numerous. School districts and universities are creating their own online courses. States have established virtual schools and a host of private providers are also offering their services. Um, states like Michigan, Idaho, and Florida have also adopted requirements that mandate students take an online course before they graduate from high school. Um, but the rise of online and distance education has also brought up a lot of questions and concerns about quality, um, access, and how to sort through all the type of options that are out there for schools and for students. Um, studies in Colorado and Minnesota suggested that full-time online student achievement there didn't measure up to peers in traditional face-to-face -face school set settings. And um, as someone mentioned earlier, the, the research field is still catching up when it comes to evaluating the effectiveness of online education. But the good news is that today we have two very knowledgeable experts here to discuss the state of online education from their perspective and what we're going to see in the future. We'll hear from James Worley, the director of the Internet 2 K-20 initiative, and Eric Fingerhut, the vice president for education and STEM learning at the Battelle Memorial Institute. Um, and after we have a chat, we're going to invite you to ask questions, so be thinking about them through our discussion. So James, I want to start with you. If you could just tell us a little bit about your initiative and particularly about how you're meshing higher education and K-12 with technology. Sure, well, so I'll start by saying uh, the Internet 2 K-20 initiative has sort of grown in, uh, into a, a larger effort called the USU Can, but uh, it has continued to focus on uh, connecting community anchor institutions across the country to various state and regional not-for-profit research and education networks, and to Internet2, which is our, our national uh, you know, high-performance network, which is dedicated to serving uh, research and education community in the United States. So um, just to give you a quick sense for the, the number of institutions that are currently connected, uh, see where we are today, there are roughly uh, 65,000 community anchor institutions connected um, to this advanced infrastructure, uh, of which about 54,000 or so, we es it's an estimate, but about 54,000 are K-12 schools. Uh, and so that's roughly about a third of all uh, public and, and private various K-12 school entities in the United States. Um, so th additionally, there are about 4,500 out of the roughly 17,000 public libraries connected, uh, a, a, a fairly large number of uh, uh, baccalaureate colleges and universities, as well as uh, uh, other, you know, kind of not not for profit museums and uh, science centers, zoos, and aquaria, uh, as well. Um, so beyond connectivity, uh, the the Internet Two K Twenty initiative is really focused on um, developing communities of practice around. You know, what do you do with this connectivity? What do you actually? What can you actually achieve? Uh, and what are the what are the benefits to distance education? So I'll I'll just give you a, maybe just a, a couple examples. Sure. Um, one of them is if you consider you know, the 212 some odd uh, you know, higher ed institutions that connect to Internet2, the, the, the member, members of Internet2, there are you know, large numbers of, uh, of really high-end, sophisticated scientific apparatus equipment that are, that are on these campuses, telescopes, um, you know, electron microscopes, and this sort of thing. And so and, and, you know, sometimes these sit idle. Uh, they're not always in, uh, used for uh, research purposes. So the, uh, increasingly, these, these kind of instruments uh, are being networked to Internet2 and made available to those institutions that have, you know, the broader education community that have access to this advanced research and education networking infrastructure. Um, so we're providing access to, to, to K-12 students and, and their teachers. Uh, and, you know, what we're seeing, those that have access to this, the students that are just... Uh, the level of engagement and the excitement and kind of authenticity of using that same sort of 
equipment, literally, that uh, you know, real scientists are using on a daily basis um, is, has a pretty profound impact in their engagement levels and their enthusiasm for learning science. Um, so that's one, one area we're focusing on. Another I'll mention is uh, using the network to connect uh, you know, scientific researchers uh, various, or you know, various other experts uh, to K-12 uh, uh, students and teachers in their classroom using really high-end, sophisticated, um, you know, next-generation interactive video conferencing. Sort of as the center was describing, that kind of Star Trek environment is increasingly, we're, we're seeing in higher ed being deployed, and increasingly just beginning to see that capacity enter into um, K-12. And when you combine that with the networking infrastructure, uh, where you're removing bandwidth, it's a barrier where we've arrived, and so the future is, is here today. And what we're seeing is, you know, you have an opportunity for, say, uh, uh, you know, a marine biologist who's got his wet wetsuit on and diving gear, and he's he's a, he's he's uh, you know exploring a uh, you know the Great Barrier Reef or um, or uh, Monterey Bay uh, Marine Sanctuary, and able to communicate, you know, in real time with those students or. Uh, you know, a, a, an oceanographer is out on a research voyage um, and making new discoveries on a daily basis, being able to connect as those are happening live with students in the classroom, uh, or uh, you know, a, a physicist who's uh, working at CERN's Large Hadron Collider, sharing the discoveries in real time. And so there's there's immense learning opportunities and professional development opportunities that are enabled when when uh, you combine that technology. Um, uh, uh, you know, you deploy that technology. But there's also, I think, something else that's going on that's really interesting, and that's... Well, let me, let me stop you for one second, and let me ask Eric, because you're talking about a lot of science and technology, and so let me ask you a little bit about how STEM uh, research and what you're doing sort of uh, comes into play here. Sure. Well, I think the word of the day is going to be networks, right. because, uh, because there's, in addition to STEM, right, because I think there's two different kinds of networks that we need to talk about. One is the kind that, uh, that James has been speaking of, which is the ability to bring the technology uh, into the schools, an enormously uh, exciting statistic that he's given us, about 54,000 uh, schools already uh, being connected. Uh, but uh, if you take the examples, then, of the types of things that can come over the network, uh, the marine biologist that, that James just cited, uh, the educators know that uh, that just doesn't make a lesson like that, right? And it doesn't just connect to uh, standards and, the, uh, uh, and all the things that uh, the teachers have to do. So somehow this has to be uh, packaged into and developed into uh, the type of curriculum that can advance STEM education. Uh, the, the, and, and there's lots of good people out there doing that kind of work too. Uh, the challenge they have is how do we connect into the schools, right? Do we have to go knocking at every one of these 54,000 you know, schools and, and, and find out the name of the science teacher and, uh, you know, and connect? How, how do we do this? And so, uh, and so I want to say that there, there's really good news here because you know, I, I noted when, when the senator was speaking, he talked about how desperately behind we are um, in, in STEM education. So, so I come bearing good news, right? There, there's, a, there's a growing STEM movement uh, in this country uh, of, uh, of, of educational organizations, advocacy groups, uh, who are just focused on, uh, on building the types of community of practice uh, among STEM educators so that we can quickly um, uh, distribute out uh, into schools in, in usable formats uh, these, uh, these tools that, that James has described. So let me be more specific. So uh, Battelle's headquartered uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're best known as a, an R&D organization. We manage six of the Department of Energy National Labs and uh, a lab for uh, uh, the Department of Homeland Security and another probably billion dollars worth of research for other departments. But in our founding documents, the will of Gordon Battelle, uh, we were committed to STEM education because we knew we had to uh, train the next generation of scientists and technology leaders. So it's always been part of our mission. We helped start a single high STEM high school in Columbus called the Metro School. Uh, the state then asked us to try to spread that around the state. Uh, we now manage something called the Ohio STEM Learning Network, which is schools and programs all over the state connected together. Uh, one of the labs we manage for the Department of Energy is the Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, so uh, the state of Tennessee, which many people in the room will know was one of the original winners of the Race to the Top Award, one of the first two finalists, uh, invited uh, Aspatel, would we, would we help uh, replicate a STEM Learning Network 
uh, in Tennessee. So we now manage the Tennessee STEM Innovation Network, which is a statewide network. Uh, then, uh, with some assistance from the Gates Foundation, there were other states that were starting to do similar activities. So uh, Battelle was asked, could we try to connect up and see? Uh, we started connecting people. There was such energy around people wanting to work together to share best practices, to be able to pilot things, to get them out, uh, to get them to scale quickly. So just a month ago in Dallas, we launched a, uh, a multi-state network. It's called STEMX. So there's 13 states already that have connected together. Each of these states uh, has a, a state organization that is spreading best practices, connecting um, uh, together teachers, advocating for STEM. Uh, Battelle is sponsoring STEMX, so there's no money being wasted on administration. That's a contribution that, uh, that we make. It's headquartered at Battelle. So my point is, is that when we get uh, uh, the internet uh, uh, to into the schools and we get these uh, marine biologists, and at Battelle we have the, the scientists at the labs, uh, who many of whom are in rural areas, to the senator's point, uh, who would like to help, uh, we, are, we increasingly have a network um, that can get these things out uh, into the schools quickly. Now, I mean, these are all really amazing things. These scientists and marine biologists that schools might be able to tap into, but do the schools have the ability to, you know, the, the cool video conferencing that you talked about, the broadband capability, the technology that they need to actually bring this stuff to the students. And I know the senator talked a lot about um, rural environments, but, you know, urban environments have some of the same challenges sort of in a different way. Do you, are you finding that you can actually bring these things to the school districts? So, again, uh, James's uh, work is critical to, to spreading this. Uh, the backbone of Internet 2, I don't want to speak for him, uh, is the university community. And one of the things that the STEM networks in each state are very deliberate about um, is connecting into the university community, into their research universities, their land-grant universities. And so um, it's, it's really uh, very possible uh, for... Uh, almost every school in this country, even if they don't, ha even if they're not one of the 54,000 uh, that uh, you know that James has already connected up, but to partner with uh, a research university that has the Internet to backbone. So, for example, I mentioned you know uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. So we have a new STEM school in Knoxville, which is uh, Oak Ridge is outside of Knoxville. It's in downtown Knoxville, but you've got the University of Tennessee Knoxville uh, that they can partner up with, even though that school might not yet uh, be wired. So this is uh, the, uh, the, cri the critical partners uh, in spreading STEM education uh, are, of course, the community and their, and their schools, but also business, because uh, business brings the practical applications of science and technology. One of the things we know about STEM education, that's why the marine biologist example is such a good example, right? What helps students learn is seeing how it's applied in the real world. Business helps that with internships and, um, and, and other uh, project-based uh, activities. But then higher education, they are a critical partner. Uh, they, they train the teachers. Uh, the senator spoke about, uh, uh, about the need to continue to, to grow the number of teachers who, who have this capability, um, and, uh, uh, but also the connectivity. If I, if I could just add one other thing about, sure. the, about teachers. The senator made the point correctly that there aren't enough teachers, particularly those that have the STEM uh, subject matter expertise. And they certainly, even if they have the subject matter expertise, they may not have the experience of having worked in a lab or worked in a, a, a private uh, sector experience where they can actually uh, impart to the kids what this is about, right? We're learning, uh, we're learning this calculus because you're going to build a bridge, you know, or you're going to uh, clean the water or clean the air. Um, and so uh, the, the scientists in, in the labs, uh, again, we manage six Department of Energy labs, but, um, but those are managed by others as well. Uh, in private laboratories, these folks are, should be viewed as part of the teaching core. Uh, they can be paired with a teacher who knows the, the standards and, and has all the, uh, you know, the uh, pedagogical uh, training necessary and, light, and appropriate licensures. Uh, but, but, but what comes into the classroom uh, is that is really the, the real life teacher. So we need to view all the scientists using Internet 2's connectivity and the STEM network's uh, capacity uh, as part of our scientific teaching core. James, let me ask you, um, is state policy playing a role in, in what you're doing? Because 
there are a number of states who have now adopted these requirements that school districts provide an online course and that students take an online course before graduation. Is that helping uh, get the technology into the districts that you need? Is that is that helping your efforts? Uh, yeah, I think so. It's uh, I mean, the greater the demand for for broad, true broadband, um, uh, obviously drives uh, you know, drives the, the the build out. Uh, the the stimulus bill, I think the senator mentioned as well, has been a great boon for uh, you know efforts toward connect further deepening uh, connectivity out, especially into rural areas where. You know, billions of dollars were invested in the infrastructure, both uh, and it's benefited both uh, you know not-for-profit uh, organizations like Internet2 and and the various state and regional education networks, but also the partners that uh, in the private sector that are so critical to getting that tail circuit connected, that last mile circuit connected. Um, and none of this would be possible without them, and so they've benefited as well from that 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 uh, that stimulus. Uh, in, uh, investment in, in what is truly the next, you know, the, the next uh, build out of the, the interstate highway. This is we that absolutely great analogy. Um, you know, the state, uh, the state highways and the na the national uh, highways, um, and so we'll see. I think in the coming months, as the as these state and regional ed networks and various entities have been hard at work in in building out these networks, uh, we'll see more and more. Uh, uh, capacity starting to be turned up. These new circuits that were laid, new fiber cables, will actually be brought online uh, in the next year as, as the, B, as the uh, Broadband Technology and Opportunities Program, the BTOP grant monies, uh, actually start to bear, bear fruit. And of course, we've been focusing on STEM in this conversation, right. but uh, these technology, as the, uh, the build out of the broadband continues in the schools, this is going to be a boon for all sorts of education languages, right? In, in Ohio, uh, I, I served as the chancellor of the university system in Ohio. We were already talking about how do we get, uh, you know, the, the, the teachers of uh, Mandarin uh, in our universities to be uh, lecturing to all the uh, rural schools. The senator mentioned the arts, right? It's uh, Anybody who I'm sure people in this room have seen or listening have seen a, a a lesson where a virtuoso in some other city is playing alongside a high school uh, orchestra and uh, and can do that only because of the capacity of the internet uh, of internet too. So th these are uh, these are just explosive uh, opportunities. Uh, and again, to the senator's concern about rural education, it's particularly uh, of benefit to uh, to those rural communities where uh, you know we're not going to get. Uh, the, the scientists from, from the labs into every rural uh, school, but we can certainly get them connected up to work with the scientists directly. Well, at the and labs. I would argue that ur urban schools have the same issues Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, no question. Let, right. let me jump. Let me add a, a, a little a specific application, kind of building on that on the, the steam comment, the, the arts and the potential again of the network once we've got it in place to to take us kind of to the next level of distance education. Um, there's a there's a technology that was developed in primarily in Europe, uh, Europe various European uh, higher ed institutions, but in partnership with uh, uh, research and education networking folks um, called LOLA, and it simply stands for low latency. And it is uh, it's sort of it's an audio video conferencing technology that does re uh, enable this kind of real time simultaneous live musical performance uh, across re great distances uh, over research and education networks. And this, of course, has, I mean, pretty profound implications for, uh, you know, for uh, you know, music instruction in K-12. And this isn't, like you said, just isn't just about um, science, technology, engineering, math. It's also about arts and, and, and you know, other performing arts in the United States, um, uh, education, where you can, you actually now have gotten to the point, literally, where um, this technology has enabled 35, the, the performance space between these people who maybe exist, you know, living in different continents, is now what it would, would simply be on, on our orchestral stage, 35 feet. But, but I, I do want to say on the STEM field, which again, to the center's point, we are still behind, um, that the scientists in, in our public and, and private laboratories, they want to help, right? But they also have day jobs, right? So, you know, we manage uh, the Department of Energy labs and, um, and the Department of Energy expects that they're going to do research and they're going to deliver on the, you know, on the outcomes. Um, and, uh, but they very much, they're, they're passionate about education. They, they see what needs to be done in the urban and the rural schools that, that, that we're talking about. And so if we can, between the, the, the internet connectivity uh, that, that Internet 2 works on um, and the uh, curriculum scripting mm -hmm. uh, that the STEM networks uh, are making possible. 
Uh, if we can make it possible for the laboratory scientist to, uh, to, to reach the students, uh, they, they will do it in droves, and they want to. Make it dead easy for them. Right. This is, uh, well, let's talk for a minute about, I mean, one of the things that I think is a big issue for schools and districts out there is the issue of this all sounds incredibly cool, and I would love to do a <laughs> lot of this stuff, but does it really improve student achievement? And I, I think um, there's been a lag time in research, uh, and right. I know the senator said there was research into the particular program he was citing, but I think there are concerns, and districts don't want to take risks because they don't want to invest time and money and, and their teachers' um, efforts into something that is cool but may not really have an impact on student so, achievement. So, so there's, there's no question in the STEM fields that it has an impact on student achievement. I'm not an expert in, in all the academic fields, but uh, there's no question has, it has an impact. We know, research is clear, that, that, um, that is the, it is the integrated approach to learning STEM fields it is the project-based approach. I mentioned already you know, the internships and co-ops relating it to, to real-life projects um, that, uh, that is turning kids on um, to be able to see how what they're learning um, is, uh, is connected. It's also, uh, you know, we all know the research about learning differences and learning styles, uh, the ability to deliver the same content in multiple different styles is enabled uh, by, uh, by the technological right. interface. One school can't have eight different teachers for the same subject with different areas of expertise, but they can have a teacher who knows how to connect to, um, you know, to, to, those, uh, to those areas. So uh, there, there's absolutely no question that it is having an impact. Uh, I also would, would just mention, because your, your question didn't directly say it, but it implies it, uh, you know, the, the whole movement towards common core standards, right. and, I'm, and I'm sure folks who are listening know that the next uh, major product is the next generation science standards, which hopefully will also achieve the same level of acceptance at the states that language arts and math have, um, is, um, uh, is all about creating a common benchmark mm -hmm. that allows us to innovate uh, in how we achieve that benchmark. It's the opposite of creating rigid uh, you know, rigid approaches. It allows us uh, to achieve these standards uh, in a lot of different ways. So uh, I, I think that that uh, that we will that we will see the connection to achievement. I know there's concern and worry, right? If I don't just, uh, but you know, if I don't just measure these these things, but but even look at uh, you look at the College Board with the AP exams. They've completely rewritten uh, the the science. Uh, uh, sequences, biology, chemistry, physics that are going to be introduced over the next few years to be more project-based, more talking about the scientific method, uh, more inquiry-based, less just reciting the facts out of the, uh, you know, out of the science book. So that's the direction that standards, that's certainly the direction NGSS is moving, that's the direction uh, AP is moving, and I think the schools now have the opportunity through these technological platforms to open up their curriculum more than they have before. I'm, I'm really hoping with the, you know, the new standards as they, as they roll out that it will provide teachers with a, you know, a collective sigh of relief that they can now. Not yet, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, it's, it, the, the message we're sending, I think, with, with this is you know, we, we trust you. We trust you to do what, what uh, you know, you're called to do in life, which is, is uh, you know, capture a student at that point, guide a student to the point where learning can occur. And by whatever means uh, you think is best, you know, we trust you to do that. We give you the flexibility to, to utilize the technology in ways that enable them to um, you know, best guide students. And do you think the fact that the assessments need to be done online are going to sort of speed this process along of, of getting all of these things to schools? I guess it doesn't. It, it sort of depends on you know if we're talking about an asset, what an assessment actually looks like online. If it's a if it's a bubble sheet, you know, that's suddenly just a, you know a bunch of text and you're you're punching a button here with your mouse or punching a button there. That's probably not a terribly you know bandwidth intensive activity, but it does require. Uh, you know, a great deal of assurance and identity, and so identity and access management issues do come to the fore there, and something like that. If that's what an online test looked like, it's not a bandwidth issue. But if you enrich those tests with, uh, you know, multimedia or uh, you know other kinds of uh, technology that are bandwidth intensive, perhaps it would drive it. And and, and I think it's really important, Michelle, for us to, to to say, we think we're at the beginning of the development 
of the curriculum and the assessments and the tools that will be available on the technology. I mean, you know, the, the center's story about, you know, starting going from the pager, right, to, you know, to the iPad, uh, you know, we're at the pager stage of, of what can be taught on these, uh, you know, on these tools that are being available. The, the, you know, our, our point here is between the technology that, that James represents and, and the teaching networks and school networks and, and advocacy networks that, that I, I'm trying to make sure people know about, uh, that, that if, if you're out there thinking, I, I can invest time and energy and resources into a better way to, uh, you know, to offer these assessments, into a better way uh, to deliver online learning, um, go for it because it will be, uh, you know, it will be connected. And, and we don't think we're anywhere near the end of, of, of where this development of materials are. Well, I think we're going to take some questions now. Just make sure to keep your question brief and state your name and your affiliation. And we're also hopefully going to take some uh, questions from the people who are watching on the web. So all of you out there, submit some questions as well. OK. Uh, I'm going to go with this one. I'm just going to start with her in the back. Hi, my name is Courtney Crandall from Communications Daily. I completed two years of my undergrad degree through distance learning, so I've experienced both the benefits and the banes of online <laughs> education. And my question is in regards to funding for these um, new programs for the schools. Um, where did the funding come from for the programs that have already been established? And where will the funding come from for future programs? Who wants to tackle that one? Uh, well. Uh I'll start quickly on the curriculum and, and uh, uh, innovation side, and then uh, James can talk about how the Internet 2 stuff is funded. But um, we are, uh, it, it comes from everywhere, right? We've, um, the 13 state networks that form STEMx. it's a combination of, of local uh, sponsorship, foundation sponsorship, corporate sponsorship, uh, 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 governments at, uh, at every level. So uh, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a real collaborative effort. Um, and uh, and we, we need all the help we can get and all the support we can get. I think that, um, that you know, we haven't talked a lot about uh, the, the role of the business community. I mentioned it in the context of internships and co-ops but one of the, and, or, and project, you know, project-based activities. But one of the things that is behind this urgency about STEM education that the Senator spoke about is will we have the workforce of the future? Um, and, uh, you know, there's two different pieces of that. One is, will we fill specific jobs that businesses need, right? Specific technological needs. That's always a challenge. Technology is always changing. We're always going to have to keep up. But the second is, will we have a, a, a workforce that has a uh, broad based technological capacity, sophistication to adapt to the, to the changing environment in every workplace. I mean, if you've been in a financial services you know, a, a industry setting lately, it's all technology, right? Banking and finance is all technology. Um, and retail is all technology. Manufacturing is almost all technology. These things that we've taken for granted that, well, there's STEM jobs and then there's non-STEM jobs, it's just, it's just collapsing. So business has a strong interest, is my point. Um, and uh, in each of the states that, that we've been uh, fortunate to work, uh, there's very strong business uh, partnership, uh, financially and otherwise, um, and at the national level, uh, major companies uh, are supporting it. So in addition to government, we really do need to get business engaged. In terms of the funding the, the, the technology, both the equipment as well as uh, you know, the, the, the circuits, the, the actual connectivity piece, I you know, echo a lot of, I think, what Eric's saying. It's, there, it's a it's a mix, uh, and you know, for for connectivity, of course, the big uh, source of, of funding, particularly in K twelve and libraries, is is the E rate program. So, um, you know, as as uh, as that program, as as we continue to strive to make that program more efficient and find, you know, additional resources uh, within that funds, uh, in the within those funds, or ideally, we add to the to the to the pot the, uh, if that's if that's a possible, uh, that will help drive, I think, uh, you know, schools' ability to afford, you know, getting to that next level of, of connectivity. When I mentioned that Lola technology, we're talking about 100 megabits dedicated uh, connectivity just to do black and white performance, performance to each other and, and 
uh, performed in black and white. If you're talking about in full living color, 500 megabits uh, of dedicated bandwidth. That's for that, that one inst instance of collaboration between um, you know, the master um, uh, and the student or between two, two performers. Uh, in a, uh, and so to get us to that next level, what's possible with distance learning, uh, it's going to take a lot of bandwidth. And that bandwidth isn't free. Let's take another question. The woman right there in the white. You. Um, hi, I'm Allie Little. I'm with the Children's Defense Fund. Um, I'm also a college student, so a lot of this feels really relevant to me. Yeah. I've grown up using the internet. I use Skype all the time. Um, and I've had some classes that really integrated some of these uh, components. Um, nothing quite as cool as some of the things we've uh, heard about. <laughs> But also, um, some of my best classes have actually been with professors who completely prohibited us from using laptops. You know, they had a PowerPoint, but it was very simple. They didn't really use any of this technology, and that's kind of showed me that there's no substitute for a really great teacher and a really strong learning community in a classroom. Um, and I guess, how do you seek to integrate all this great innovation with understanding some of the qualitative limitations of technology in the classroom? Great question. So uh, obviously, I think it's both. You know, we spoke about this a little bit before. I mean, we've we've been um, the, what what the uh, the internet capability allows you to do is to access expertise and excellence that you could not get in every school um, in in this country. Um, by the way, it's also true at the higher ed level. Um, not every school has access to, um, you know, to all of the opportunities, but certainly we've been talking mostly about K-12 and rural schools and, 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 urban, uh, and urban schools. Um, so that also frees up uh, the teachers in the classroom to, uh, to, to be uh, better facilitators, to be more focused on the learning of each, uh, of each child. Um, it's a... You know, it's a little bit of a specialization, if you will, um, that, is, that, that enables us, uh, uh, you know, to do better uh, overall. Um, and simply, you know, simply put, there are too many schools in this country that do not have access to quality STEM teaching because they don't have access uh, to teachers who have either the subject matter knowledge or the ability to relate it uh, to something that, that, students, uh, that students can access. And we're, we're simply... There's lots of efforts that out there to, to generate more science teachers, but anybody who's been involved in that can tell you that we're not going to get there fast enough. Um, we're going to lose a whole generation of kids. And so these are the opportunities to, to reach those kids. James, what do you think? Well, I'm, I, to me, this is also an opportunity. There are a tremendous number of teachers that, you know, that they haven't given up. They've, they're, they, you know, they, maybe they, 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 weren't, they aren't digital natives, but they see, they, they see through, the, through their younger colleagues the power uh, and the ability uh, to, to, to educate that technology helps enable. It, it properly used as a tool, as any tools, if you can apply it to the, uh, to the job at hand correctly, you know, it, 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 it yields results. And so, I mean, perhaps as the, we can use that same technology to help uh, distribute, you know, the expertise you know, within the profession more uh, effectively, and, and so you can you can have the the young mentoring you know some some of the uh, uh, more experienced teachers you know the, with more years under the belt that haven't had much time with the technology. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, you can use the technology in so many ways in that respect. And I would just also say I've done a lot of reporting about online learning, and I think you know the research shows you know you have to be a good teacher first before you can be a good online teacher. And there are states that are starting to think about. Um, requiring teachers who want to be online teachers to have additional certification or additional training to become a full-time online teacher. Another question? How about over on this side? <coughs> International Federation of Training and Development Organizations. The, uh, my question uh, was triggered by the remark that uh, the federal government had a strong role in the recovery through the recovery program to do the laying of uh, the, um, what, what do we call it? Broadband. Yeah. Broadband. Mm -hmm. Okay. My question comes at this time in our history. We seem to have a, a, a dialogue going on between the importance or the unimportance of government in the future. Now, um, if we are moving towards less government involvement or the devaluing of of government, how will this affect 
the effectiveness of moving ahead, which indicates a business and government partnerships. Well, let me just say uh, quickly and then turn to James. I think there's two roles of government in education. Um, one of them is essential, and the other has been occasionally been problematic. Um, the essential part is the investment part. Um, you know, as James pointed out, we wouldn't have the broadband connectivity in my state, uh, in Ohio, when I was chancellor of the university system. We received, you know, $120 million or $130 million out of the, the Recovery Act to connect up schools, and uh, we couldn't have done it without it, and, and absolutely essential. On the other hand, uh, we also do have um, a regulatory environment in education that often restricts us from being innovative. So a lot of these, um, uh, what, what, what government enables by connecting us to broadband, they have been making it hard for us to take advantage of uh, by opening up student experiences um, in, a way, you know, in a way they should. And this isn't just federal, this is obviously state, uh, often you know, K-12 in this country is often as heavily regulated, more heavily regulated by the states than it is uh, at the federal level. So, so I, I, I'd love to, you know, we know that with money comes uh, accountability um, and responsibility, uh, but also we need more flexibility uh, to be able to innovate in this area. Do you want to add anything, James? Oh, just, you know, I mean, just the, there's no question in my mind, I think most people would agree that, well, I shouldn't say that we're in Washington. <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, the federal government throughout our history has played a role, right? And if, if you define that, at least in terms of the infrastructure, if you define this as an infrastructure build, then I think most people would align that, yeah, there's some role for, for um, the federal government, as it always has, there always has been um, in our country's history. First, you know, going, you know, like just looking at um, uh, you know, ele bringing, electrifying rural America did the government play a role there? Obviously, they did. Uh, it wouldn't have happened uh, if just left to the, to the private sector. And I mean, I, I think so. It's just make sure we frame this the, in terms of the you know the build of the infrastructure in, as an infrastructure effort, and not. Uh, I think as a senator, there are some uh, conception that this is a, as a social social service, broadband as a social service. Again, Peggy Ochowski with a Hispanic Outlook on Higher Education. Uh, been a lot of news the last couple of days on the University of Virginia joining this. Um, uh, Coursera. Uh, yes, Coursera, which ah, doesn't do revenue. Ha there's no revenue involved. There's, th th it assumes, I guess, that every, everybody in the world has a, a high-tech computer that they're going to be able to, to catch these courses on. I mean, what this seems a little bit... Um, Really stepping out of the box. What what is the what what do you see the advantages of Coursera to the to a university to a higher ed learning? Uh, some of my experiences, some of the, uh, the um, uh, articles I've been doing of showing that that on these online uh, courses, at at the end there, there's zero completion rates. Yeah. Uh, so so I'll be Pollyanna. Uh, <laughs> I think this is the most remarkable uh, social development uh, of certainly of the last few years. I mean, this is America's, one of, one of America's greatest products is our higher education system. It's extraordinary, world-class, world-leading higher education system. And we are opening it up for free to people anywhere in the world. And with all respect, you'd be amazed how many people in the world have, uh, have uh, broadband connectivity but didn't have access to a University of Virginia course or a Stanford course or, a, uh, you know, or one of these other great courses. And, uh, and, and there are, in fact, um, uh, people all over the world now that are accessing for free that which only an elite small number of people uh, could, could utilize. So uh, you, we talked about Coursera. Um, I'm a little more familiar with Udacity because partner, uh, Battelle has a partnership with Udacity. So Udacity the, the, you know, sprung out of this uh, professor at, uh, at Stanford, uh, Peter Thrun, uh, some, uh, who uh, opened his computer programming class uh, to the world, just put it online, 
Um, and 160,000 people signed up, 30,000 finished, 10,000 took an assessment that showed that they had uh, mastered it. The, the most famous story is this kid in Afghanistan who was dodging mortar fire um, and had connectivity for one hour a day and finished the course. You, I, I'm sorry, I, I, maybe I'm just not cynical enough, but I just think that is such an extraordinary uh, a gift uh, and uh, certainly at some point uh, it'll have to be monetized and at some point there'll be fees uh, you know, associated with it. Uh, but the fact that, that our great universities uh, are racing each other now uh, to, um, you know, to open up their, uh, their curriculum to anyone in the world, not just the you know, student who's lucky enough to get into Stanford or lucky enough to get into UVA, uh, I just think only good can come of it. And I will tell you, so the partnership with Udacity that Patel has um, is back to K-12. So we partnered with them this summer to uh, invite high school students to take uh, college level courses. So they, we, we're sponsoring teams. It's a competition. You can go to udacity.com. You can still sign up, I think. Um, um, and so teams of high school students are signing up. Uh, we had something like 350 teams last time I checked to take Udacity courses online. These are Stanford level computer science courses online. And the team that takes the most courses and has the most students complete it, we're gonna fly out to California. They're gonna to go to the Googleplex. They're gonna to get to ride in the Google self, you know, uh, what's it called, the self-driving car, and put on the glasses and all the cool stuff that Google's doing and get awards. I mean, this is, this is how you can build excitement among, uh, among high school kids. And talk about your rural kids or your inner city kids. They didn't have this chance, uh, you know, before this technology uh, came along, before the universities opened up. So is it perfect? Is it open to, every, you know, is it accessible to everybody? No, it's not perfect yet. We've got a lot. We're at the beginning. This is, the, this is the stone age of this development, but, but it's an exciting development, and it's changing the world. Uh, the number, one of the number one finishers in the Udacity course was a 40-year-old nurse in Ireland. I mean, these are people being discovered, you know, <laughs> brilliant people all over the world who have a chance now uh, to access uh, the greatest uh, education in the world. So again, I'm Pollyanna, but I think it's fabulous. No, I'm, I'm, equally, <laughs> I'm equally as Pollyanna. I mean, I was a Peace, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in, in Africa, in Malawi. I mean, it's a the, you know, extremely poor country in Central, Central Africa. And I mean, the kids that I, that I taught physics to, uh, I had a piece of chalk in it, and you know, chalkboard essentially. And these kids, some of them, were the brightest kids I've ever encountered in my life. They just happened to be born, you know, in one of the poorest countries in the world. And, um, you know, they would walk, you know, they would walk for miles every day, literally. Um, and I don't know how they did this, but they kept their shirt clean, white press, <laughs> and it was pressed every day. And I mean, what, this this is this is the sort of thing that we're enabling these kids. It's yeah, I mean, and it's and it's early childhood too. I mean, a professor at MIT Media Lab and her and her colleague at Tufts uh, did got funded. They did an experiment where they dropped iPads into sub-Saharan Africa that only had had English reading lessons on it. They didn't tell them how to use the iPads. They didn't give any instruction, and these kids within a month were speaking English wow. and reading English because they figured out how to turn on the machines and they figured out. So it's an extraordinary revolution that we're about to see in education. Right. Well, we have time for one more question. Let me just. I'm Urvashi Sani, and I'm a guest scholar at Brookings from India. Um, I just want to applaud what you just said, because coming from a country where uh, there's most of the population is in rural areas and we are struggling with trying to reach quality education, we are trying everything we can with technology to get there. And I'm hoping the infrastructure will work fast and so that we'll be able to access all the wonderful resources that uh, other universities have. Uh, my question was that uh, in India, though internet has, we don't have broadband everywhere, but the mobile phones have penetrated everywhere. So is there something that we're doing with mobiles here, with mobile phone technology that we could use, and how does one access that? There, sure, there, I mean, yeah, there's, there's tremendous in, uh, daily improvement in, if we just take video conferencing, for example, uh, more and more of the, the you know, desktop ven uh, video conferencing vendors are, are making their products available in a mobile platform and developing codecs that can deal with, you know, dodgy connectivity and through the mobile networks all the way up to, you know, proper 4G or whatever. Uh, and so it, there are, there are am amazing opportunities over mobile. It's, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's a, that's a, compl a, 
a, a profound you know, vehicle by which you can, you can push this stuff out. And, and just to point out again, this is an area for further development. There's no question that, that there, we're not yet where we need to be on the use of mobile devices in education. But as the broadband builds out, the opportunity now for, for creative developers and innovators in this field um, to, uh, you know, to do a better job than what exists, you know, come on, bring it on. We need it. We need better tools uh, to, you know, to, to educate over mobile devices with students. There's no question. And I'll just add, I just recently did a story about um, the Memphis School District in Tennessee, and they have, uh, even though their state doesn't require students to take an online course for graduation, this district put that requirement in place. And they're having trouble uh, getting all their students access. Um, not all the students had laptops at home or were connected at home, but every student, their parent, had a mobile phone. So they adapted this online course for mobile phones, and now the students can access it um, through the phone. So, Well, I just want to thank everyone for a great discussion today and thank our two panelists. Thank you very much for your Thank you. Good job. Thank you.